uh, to our service here at Charleston Community Church. Uh, it's great to see you all here this morning. It's good to um, be running out of seats. Um, uh, welcome, everyone. If you are a wearied, broken sinner, you are most welcome. This is what the church is for. It's not for people who have it sorted. It's not for people um, who think that they can just have everything perfect in life. It's for people broken, people hurting, people suffering, people knowing that we need a saviour. And we're here to worship him. We're so grateful that we have him. Uh, his name is Jesus. He has died for our sin. He's made us right with God. And this is a worship service to him. And so we want to walk in step with him. So I'm going to read some words from the book of Psalms uh, just to lead us into our time of worship. I'm going to read some words from Psalm 1. And if the band, aka Rachel and Laura, want to come up, we're going to sing this psalm together. Um, psalm 1 says this. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Well, as we begin our service, uh, let's uh, sing these words and remind ourselves of why it's so important to walk in the steps of the Lord and to follow him. Let's stand and sing together uh, Psalm 1. Uh, the tune's Amazing Grace, by the way. Have a seat. I'm going to pray now, just off the back of that psalm. I'm going to just pray for a few things. Uh, we're also like to pray for a different country uh, each week. So we're going to pray this week for the nation of Somalia. 
An anyone know anything about Somalia? It's in Africa, I think. It's in Africa, good. Uh, uh, oh, I don't know. I don't that, that was Pakistan. Um, normally, Somalia is associated with quite negative things. Yeah. Piracy yeah. being a big one. Um, well, that's famine. That's right. Yeah, set in, that, set in Somalia. So we want to pray for that nation. 16.3 million people there. Um, around 500,000, half a million people have died from famines and many more from violence. Decades of chaos have provided cover for smugglers and bandits and pirates and terrorists. It's a dangerous environment and the strict enforcement of uh, Islam prevents most aid work. And so we want to pray for effective ministry um, uh, effective ministry for aid workers out there um, it's especially difficult in that nation if you're a Somali woman many endure um, horrible treatment including uh, genital mutilation rape divorce and abandonment by their husbands um, so it's a lot of troubles in that country we want to pray that um, well we want to pray that wickedness would be undone just like we sung and that there would be an opportunity for the gospel to go out and to bring hope and healing to that land. And we want to pray especially for the church. The Somali church was driven underground in 1991. Um, and so many, several hundred Somali believers, they fled the country. Um, there's possibly around 4,000 Somali Christians. It's hard to know because it's all kind of top secret underground stuff. And so we'll just pray that through those believers, God would cause his gospel to thrive and to spread and to bring hope and life and light in that nation. And we're also going to pray for um, the work of 20 schemes. We are part of an organization that wants to plant churches and housing schemes across Scotland. It's called 20 Schemes. Um, I don't know that, uh, why it's called 20 Schemes because we're getting close to 20 plants now. There's 11 churches that have been planted in the past 10 years associated with 20 Schemes and it's um, their 10 year anniversary and we just want to give thanks to God for the many people and housing schemes across Scotland that have been brought to know Jesus uh, through this ministry. Um, so we'll pray for both those things, pray for the nation of Somalia, and we're going to pray for the work of 20 schemes and we'll pray for ourselves as we come to study God's word together. Let me pray. Father God, thank you that your law, your word guides us in the way of righteousness. Father, thank you that when we come to study your word, when we come to um, understand the great truths of the gospel, it's like a tree planted by streams of water. It's been fed joy and nourishment. It's what our souls so desperately need. So, Father, we want to walk in the path of righteousness, not the path of wickedness. And, Father, we know that that doesn't mean being perfect. And so we want to admit to, to you this morning as your church that we are far from perfect we want to admit that we're sinners we want to admit that we've let you down we want to admit that we have mucked up in so many different ways this past week father we don't want to pretend that everything's fine we bring our sin to you now as your church we bring it to you and we ask almighty god please would you have mercy would you forgive us and father as we do that we we do so grateful that our standing before you, our acceptance before you is nothing to do with how well we perform, but it's all to do with Christ and what he has done for us. And so as we confess our sins to you, Lord, we also acknowledge that Jesus Christ has taken all that sin on himself. He has suffered the punishment for it and we are free. Father, we have been made righteous. We have not earned that righteousness, but Jesus has given it to us out of his grace and mercy. We don't deserve anything, and yet we have everything. And so we want to praise you that we are forgiven sinners. We want to praise you, Jesus, that we are adopted into your family, that we are set free. There's no condemnation for us. And we will be with you in glory for all eternity because of what you have done. Thank you, Jesus, for that. Father, we also want to pray for the many people that don't know this wonderful, eternal hope that comes from the gospel. And specifically today, Lord, we want to pray for the nation of Somalia. Father, so, 
so much crazy stuff going on in that nation, so much suffering. And we just pray, Almighty God, that you would put an end to evil, an end to injustice, an end to brutal regimes and the mistreatment of others. And we pray that you would give opportunities for the gospel to thrive, that the hope of Jesus would spread in an area of the world where it seems impossible to talk about Jesus. And yet nothing can stop the gospel spreading. Even when your church is persecuted, it will spread all the more. And so we want to pray, Lord, particularly for the 4,000 plus Somali Christians in Somalia now. We pray, Almighty God, that they would be protected from evil. We pray, Father, that they would grow in their faith. We pray that you would give them boldness and wisdom as they seek to meet as your people and encourage one another. And Father, we pray that they would show grace and love that is so attractive that it draws people into the Lord Jesus. Father, please, would there be a mighty moving of your spirit in that nation. We pray for the the six million Somalia um, people dispersed throughout the world. Lord, would you work through them, giving them the opportunities to hear the gospel that they wouldn't have perhaps back home. Father, would that be used to bless the nation of Somalia. And Father, we pray for the Somali Bible. Lord, we thank you that it has been translated into a language that people can understand, even though it can only be distributed outside of that nation. Please, would you give an opportunity for your word to go forth in that part of the world and do your work. Father, we also want to pray for the work of 20 Schemes. We thank you for this organization. Lord, we thank you for these 11 churches um, associated with 20 Schemes. 11 churches that 10 years ago did not exist and now they are there sharing the good news of Jesus and the housing schemes across Scotland. Father, we thank you for the lives that have been transformed, for how you have rescued sinners and completely changed them by your grace and mercy. We thank you for the hope of the gospel that these churches share. And Lord, we want way more than 20 churches and housing schemes across Scotland. We want to see many, many more hundreds of churches in the schemes of this nation, reaching those who are struggling, who are hurting, those who are impoverished. Father, we know that there's great hope in this eternal gospel. And so please, would you raise up many more churches in the schemes of our land? And would Jesus be honoured and glorified through the ministry of these churches? And Father, we pray for us now as we come to study your word. We do delight in your law, O Lord, and we pray that we'd be filled with a sense of joy and comfort at hearing what you have to say to us. Would you speak to us? Would you help us understand it, Lord? And would we see Jesus, our great and gracious Saviour, in whose name we pray? Amen. 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 Um, Just a couple notices before um, we look at the next bit of 1 Corinthians. Next weekend is the 20 Schemes Weekender. It's a conference through in Nidre, it's a housing scheme in Edinburgh. Um, Rachel's booked tickets, but you know, if you really want to go, if you're not sure if you're booked, speak to Rachel. If you're not sure about transport, we're going to organize um, cars and stuff. Again, just speak to Rachel. Um, Rachel's, well, you know who Rachel is, playing the guitar. Um, And so, um, yeah, please do. If you want to go to that, if you want to start a transport for that, that's next weekend, so Saturday, The conference is all day. There's a thing on the Sunday evening as well, um, a service of Thanksgiving where um, a lot of the churches will get together. Uh, What it is, is just all the churches have said there's 11 churches been planted and they all just get together, people from those churches, um, and we listen to talks um, throughout the day. It's a good time of just being together, um, hearing from God's word together, singing praises together. And it's really good just when we're all together, there'll be a There'll be a big crowd there, and it'll be lots of fun. Get people to check out the trains and make sure the problems with the trains, Andy. Yeah, well, don't worry. I think there is going to be problems with the trains, but we're going to organise cars, so nobody needs to... I think the only one taking a train might be me, so thank you, because I'll need to check that. The buses are okay. The buses are all right. The buses are all right. Okay, that's better anyway. So, um, yeah, so if you do want to go, um, it's going to be great. It's going to be really encouraging, um, and we'll sort stuff out. We'll make it work for you if you really want to go, and... Um, you won't have to pay anything either we'll try and cover the costs as best as we can um, for those that uh, don't want to pay for it so that's next weekend speak to Rachel if you want any more information about that Uh, also just to say on the 19th of November 
going to do a vision day. Look at that. Look at the state of that building. That's what it used to look like. Look how beautiful it is now. Um, on the 19th of November, that's a Saturday, we're doing a vision day from 9.30 in the morning to 1. Now, what that is, is it's just a, um, you, everyone's welcome to it. It's just a chance for the church to go over what its mission is, what its vision is, what we hope to do, how we hope to serve the scheme here in Charleston, and to brainstorm ideas that we can develop and do things better, um, encourage one another, pray with one another. It's just a time just to, for us as a church to get kind of focused on what our mission is here uh, in the scheme. So that's going to be on the 19th of November. Um, just getting that down now, just as like a date to get in your diaries, if you've got it, or your mental diaries, if you're like me. Um, it's never a good idea. But 19th of November, that's when we're hoping to have the Vision Day um, venue to be confirmed. But uh, we'll let you know and if it's... If, uh, might be. It might be. So we might have it on a big church st peter's on the perth road but again if people wanted to come to that we'd organize lifts um and transport for that um so that's the two things next weekend is 20 schemes weekender and then we've got a vision day on the 19th of november and if you could come along to that be great it's good just to hear we want to hear from everyone we want to kind of pitch and work together um and get on track with our vision right if you've got a bible open it up to 1 corinthians chapter 9 on Corinthians chapter 9. 1151. Thank you. Ah, so good. 863-1151. Way ahead of it. Um, Tammy's going to come up and read to us in a minute from uh, chapter 9, verse 24. to. Uh, uh, it's good. Chapter 9, verse 24. And she's going to read through to chapter 10, verse 22. Um, so we've been studying this book in the Bible for a few few weeks now. Um, it's actually a letter. It's written by the Apostle Paul to a church in Corinth. Uh, it's a church that thinks it's great. They think they're really mature. They think they're really spiritual. They think that they are doing brilliant. But in actual fact, they're a complete mess. Um, they're very arrogant. And they seem to be drifting further and further away from God. Now, in chapters 8 through 10, Paul has been exposing how immature and far from the gospel this church is by addressing an issue that was a big deal for them. And the issue was this, should we eat meat sacrificed to an idol? Um, not a big issue you're going to hear in churches today, but in Corinth, that was a, that was a huge issue because these guys were surrounded by pagan temples and statues. I think there was around about 17 different gods in Corinth. Um, so it was just everywhere and all the meat that you got in the street, right? You wouldn't go to Tesco, you would go to the local pagan butcher. It would be meat that was left over from sacrifices to one of these like 17 different gods. And so if you're a Christian there, you're thinking, well, should I eat this meat or should I not? Now the Corinthians, they think they've got it sussed, right? So they say, yeah, just eat what you want, right? Idols are nothing. You're free to do as you please. And Paul has been saying in these chapters, well, that is not how you should be thinking. Your freedom in Christ is not there to benefit you now. Rather, you should be thinking what builds up Jesus' church for eternity. So chapter 8, he says, look, yeah, idols are nothing. But if you're eating meat sacrificed to an idol and it's luring someone else in the church back to their old lifestyle, don't do it. Out of love for them, don't do it. Then in chapter 9 that we looked at last week, he says, you know, that the Corinthians should be like him. They should be willing to give up their rights, not just for those in the church, but also for those outside the church to try and reach them with the gospel. And he's completely dismantling their selfish mindset of just doing what's right for me and for my comforts. Now, here in chapter 10, end of chapter 9, chapter 10, Paul's now going to give a warning because here's what seems to be happening, right? Some of the folks in Corinth were becoming so relaxed in eating meat sacrificed to idols, they were actually going a bit too far and they were going along to these temples and joining in the worship of these false gods. So chapter 8, if chapter 8 is about eating a kebab with halal meat, Paul says that's fine as long as it doesn't cause someone to sin. Chapter 10 is someone going to the mosque, right? It's kind of going too far the other way. The Corinthians had become so relaxed that they're actually slipping away from God and starting to worship false gods. And so that's what he is addressing now 
in this section. So he's going to come read it to us. Uh, it's chapter 9, verse 24, to chapter 10, verse 22. Do you not know that in a, a race all the runners run, but not one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. Everyone who completes in the games into goes into strict cra training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not like fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I will, I myself will not be disqualified for the price, prize. Warning from Israel's history. For I do not want you to be ignored of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were sc scattered in the wilderness. Now, that, now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in reverie. Uh, we, we should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did. And we and were killed by snakes and do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and they were written down as warnings for us, on whom the accumulation of the, an the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you, except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can hear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you can endure it. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. It is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks, a participation in the blood of Christ, and is not the bread that we break, our participation in the body of Christ, because there is one love, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean then that food sacrificed to an idol is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to participate with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have take part in both the Lord's table and the table of the demons. Are we trying in to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Um, we're going to look at that Bible passage together. Um, before we do though, we're going to sing a song called Trust and Obey. The great news about the gospel is um, we don't need to do anything to be saved from our sins. we just got to trust Jesus. And he forgives all sins, no matter what they are, past, present, and future. But because he forgives us, because we love him, we want to obey him and we want to trust him with our lives. So this is a song that calls us to do that because we know that actually the best way to live is to live in obedience to Jesus. So let's stand and sing. Uh, trust and obey and then we'll look at that Bible passage together. Grace for it all. 
Okay, um, if you want to get your Bibles open to that passage that uh, Jonathan read to us, uh, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 24 to 10 verse 22. Um, I wonder, just as we begin, you know, you might be here, you might be a Christian, you might be here, you might be investigating Christianity, or maybe you're not a Christian, but maybe just think in your head, how would you describe what it's like to live as a Christian, right? What images might we think of when we think of life as a Christian? Maybe some people think it will be a breeze. It's kind of light and airy fairy. I mean, the good news of Jesus, right, is the best news you're ever going to hear. Come to Jesus. I give Jesus all my sin. Jesus suffers for my sin in my place. I'm made right with God forever. Nothing's going to change that. Nothing can take that from me. So how do I live if I know that's true? Knowing that I'm free from all sin. Let me say, if you think it will be easy, if you think, you know, I can just live how I want, Jesus will forgive me, then you don't know who Jesus is or the impact of what he's done. Because if you do follow Jesus and you accept this free offer of salvation, you want to live for him in response to that. And living for him is really hard at times. It's the best way to live. It's joy. It's like we just sang. It's happiness. But it's really difficult. In fact, um, in 1 Corinthians 9.24, Paul says that living like a Christian is like being in a race. That's what it's like. So let me ask you. Say I told you guys, right, you know, I'm thinking of running the London Marathon in a few weeks or whenever that is. And you notice that um, I hadn't really done much training for that. In fact, the only exercise I do are taking those little electric bikes outside of the community centre, which I do do that. You might see me bombing around the scheme on them. And I'm eating in Tandoori Hut every night. I don't do that. I'm eating in Tandoori Hut. I'm just having McDonald's. I'm not really doing any exercise. I'm spending all my free time just playing video games. How seriously would you think I was taking that race? Not that serious, eh? If I live like that, it would show that I don't really care about it, and I certainly don't think I'm going to win it. I don't care about winning a prize at the end of it. I'm just doing what I want. Well, that is exactly how the Corinthians are treating their life as Christians. They're not taking it seriously. They're just relaxed. They're becoming lazy. They're doing what they want, and they have completely lost sight of the future prize of being with Jesus. See, Paul's not like that, though. He's different. Look at what he says, verse 25. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul's saying, look, I'm going to work hard at following Jesus. 
You know, it's hard, because it is hard. It's hard for me not to be selfish all the time. It's hard for me to look out to the needs of others. It's hard to, to fight temptation that seems to be there all the time, to flee from sin. It's hard to focus on building up Jesus' kingdom, not my kingdom. But I'm going to work at it because I know it's not pointless. I'm not running about aimlessly, not knowing where I'm going. I know what the end is. I'm not beating the air, not knowing who I'm fighting. I know exactly what I am here to do and I'm going to work at it because at the end is the prize of the eternal glory of being with Jesus. That is not how the Corinthians are thinking in life. I mean, this whole issue of eating meat sacrificed to an idol has kind of really exposed what they're like. So they only want to do what benefits them now. There's no eye on the eternal prize. They, they only care about themselves. There's no desire to work hard at living others, at loving others. They only want to do what makes them comfortable. There's no giving up their rights for the sake of reaching the lost with the gospel. And, and I think Paul is, um, I think he's really worried that these guys are not going to make it. They're not going to make it to heaven. They've stopped running. They don't care about sin. It's kind of devouring them. It's blinding them. You see, eating meat sacrificed to an idol is, isn't wrong. I mean, idols aren't real. But for some in this church, like I said in the introduction, they've become so relaxed in that that they're starting to go too far. They're starting to eat this meat at the temple and they're getting involved in pagan worship. So it's like going to the pub. It's not a sin to drink. It's not a sin to go to the pub. But if you become too relaxed in that and you start going every night and you start finding yourself gradually getting drunk all the time, that is a sin. You're drifting further away from Jesus and into sin. Go on. You just got into flog, really, eh? Well, yeah. And I think that's what they're like spiritually with Jesus. They've become quite lazy but with him. Still a church, no? Yeah, Corinth is still a place, so there'll still be a church there. I don't believe the same kind of stuff, no? No, because this was like, we're going back, um, well, almost 2,000 years ago. So all that idol worship stuff isn't really prevalent in today's society. Ah, well, it kind of is, but we'll come to that in a bit. But it's, it's a slightly different issue. But underneath the issue of the meat sacrificed to idols is the fact that they're not taking sin seriously. Yeah. And they're just thinking, I just do what I want. And that's a really dangerous position for them to be in. And Paul wants to warn them in this chapter and I think this is such an important message off the back of um, last week. Because last week, Paul said to these Christians, he's like, you should be out in the world, right? You shouldn't be in your little Christian bubble, just doing nothing. You should give up your rights for the sake of reaching others in the world with the gospel. But we should never do that in a way that compromises our holiness. So we need to be disciplined in this race as we journey to eternity. How do we do that? How do we make sure that we're not being like the Corinthians and we're just losing sight and we might fall back? Well, I've got three points um, from this passage that will help you if you follow Jesus to stick with Jesus. Three points. Christian life is a race. How do we keep going? Firstly, let's learn from the warnings of the past. Secondly, let's flee from the idols of the future. And thirdly, let's look to the prize. Oh, sorry, <laughs> idols of the present. Thirdly, look to the prize of the future. Learn from the warnings of the past. Flee from the idols of the present. And thirdly, look ahead to the prize of the future. That's the th three things I think will help us not drift from Jesus, but run this race in a way that loves him and loves others. Let's look at it. Firstly, learn from the warnings of the past. Um, the Apostle Paul right, is a great example to us of what giving up your rights for the sake of others looks like. We saw that last week. Here in chapter 10, though, he wants to give us a negative example. And it comes from the history of the people of Israel. There was a moment in their history and they didn't make it. They were God's people, but they didn't make it. You know, history is a, a great teacher. Uh, I remember many years ago, I went to a village in France the village was called Oradour, uh, and what made this village was unique was that it was a ruin left over from the Second World War. 
And what happened was that when the Nazis invaded France as part of a training exercise, the SS surrounded this village and it didn't have any sort of spies or people in it, just innocent people. The SS surrounded this village and they executed everyone in the village and uh, burnt down the whole place, well, most of it. And after the Second World War, the French government decided that they were going to keep the village exactly as the Nazis had left it, as a memorial to remind people of the horrors that people in France had experienced during uh, the Second World War. And you can go into this village, you can walk around it. It's one of the most fascinating places I've ever been to. I remember walking into what was left of the, the church there. And actually in this church, they had a memorial from the First World War. And you could go into the church and you would see round the wall still are littered the bullet holes. That was the place where they took the women and children in and executed them. And you can still see it there. Um, the whole place was quiet. It's a ghost town, obviously. There's a sense of reverence as you walk around it. And then as you leave, there's this little archway that you walk under. And it says this above the archway. It's a quote from a historian called Santiana. And it says this, those who don't learn from history will be forced to repeat its mistakes. In other words, look back at that and let's make sure that never happens again. Paul is saying to the Corinthians here at the start of this chapter, I want you to look back with me at Israel's history and I want you to make sure that doesn't happen again, that you are not like the people of Israel were. And he's referring to a time in Israel's history when they had just been rescued from slavery um, out of Egypt through um, God's rescuer, Moses. You can read about it in the book of Exodus and Numbers. God rescued all these people is when he began his nation and only two of them made it to the promised land because the rest chose to rebel against God and not follow him, despite experiencing the blessing of his salvation. And what Paul is saying here is he's saying, look, you Corinthians are scarily similar to the Israel of the past. Look at verse 1 of chapter 10. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual fruit, food and drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. People, right? Rescued by God. How did it end up for them? Bodies in the desert. They didn't make it. And see, here's what the Corinthians thought, right? They'd become so relaxed in their walk with Jesus, they thought, you know, I've been baptized. I've had communion. You know what communion is? The bread and the wine. I've had that in church, so oh, I'm safe. I can just do what I want. And by the way, I think, you know, there's many in the scheme here that think that. I think that's, that's one of the, the, the dangers that can come out of some of Roman Catholic teaching, that the idea of being baptized and having communion, that does not mean that you're a Christian. That does not mean you're going to go to heaven if you've been baptized and you've had communion. And Paul says, look, see Israel in the past. They had a kind of baptism, right? Then they, they passed through the Red Sea. God parted the waters. It was like passing through water, a sign of salvation. You know, they had a kind of communion. They ate bread that fell from heaven. It was spiritual food given by God. They had that close connection with the presence of Christ. He even says that the rock, they, there was a story of um, Moses hitting a rock and water coming out of it. Paul says that rock was Christ. And what he means doesn't mean that literally the rock was Christ, but the source of their nourishment came from Jesus. Just like any Christian today, Christ was with them. And yet, how did they end up? Bodies in the wilderness. They didn't make it. And so you Corinthians must not think, just because you're baptized, just because you've had communion, just because you've experienced the presence of Christ, that you're safe. There are plenty who have had that, who are in hell. Because doing these things doesn't make you genuine. Those are outward signs 
of what is inwardly genuine. Israel at that time wasn't. And we have their story, according to Paul, we have their story in the Bible to warn the church today, do not be like they were at this time. Look at what Paul mentions they did. This is why they didn't make it. Um, first of all, they were idolaters, verse 7. It says there, they ate and drank, indulged in revelry. Uh, by the way, that's a polite way of saying they had a drunken orgy as they worshipped a false god. That's what they did after God rescued them, right? Uh, secondly, they committed sexual immorality, verse 8. It's a story there he's referencing from the book of Numbers about all these guys that just go in the way and sleep in with um, these pagan women. And then thirdly, they tested Christ, verse 9. And it's just interesting to note, this was obviously thousands of years before Christ. It was God that they tested. But Paul is making the point that Jesus is the same God that rescued Israel all those years ago. They tested him, they grumbled against him. And if you read that story in the book of Numbers, um, it's not just God, it's actually Moses. It's the chosen leader that God has put over them that they are grumbling against and therefore testing God. So that was Israel. That's what they did. Now let's step back a wee bit because that list in these verses looks very familiar. For those of you that have been here as we've been going through Corinthians, this is sounding a lot like Corinth. So what have we seen? Worshipping idols? So the Corinthians are doing and going to these pagan temples. Yeah, well, I think, well, we'll come to that because I think we do a lot of it here as well. Yeah. Um, just in, in every society, we worship idols. But for the Corinthians, they were getting involved in this particular kind of temple worship, committing sexual immorality. Chapter 6, we saw that many of them were actually going to these temples to sleep with prostitutes. And finally, testing Christ and grumbling against God's chosen leader. That's exactly what the Corinthians have done with Paul the one that has been put in authority over them. They've been grumbling against him. And so Paul is saying, look, can you see the similarities? You guys are being dangerously like Israel. Your re relaxed approach to sin is going to kill you. Stop thinking you're safe. Verse 12, if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. Now, just to make something absolutely crystal clear, if you are a genuine Christian, you will never fall. If you've come to Jesus, Jesus won't let you go. You can't lose your salvation. You didn't deserve it in the first place. When Jesus saves you, he keeps you. But Paul is not sure if some in the Corinthian church are genuine. And if you are worried about falling away from God, that's often a good sign. You see, Israel of the past was not worried about that. They just wanted to do what suited them. And I think one of the ways you know that you are genuine is that you are careful to walk in obedience to God. You want to walk in obedience to God. It's like, you know, if there's a sign at the edge of a cliff that says danger, loose rocks, stay away from the edge, you might never be stupid enough to go near that edge but you prove, well, depends who you are, but you prove that you are genuinely not stupid enough by listening to the sign. What you don't, what you don't do is see how close you can get. The sign saying stay away. You don't walk to the edge. You don't stand at the edge. You don't try and stick your foot over the edge. The Corinthians are doing that with their sin. And eating at these idol temples, they're flirting with evil. They're saying how close to the edge they can get. Paul's saying, don't do it. Don't do it. That is not how you are to live. Now, for us, the problem is probably not eating at an idol temple, as far as I'm aware. But think about other areas in which we might flirt with sin. So if a TV show or a film is going to lead your mind into sinful temptation, don't watch it. If a group of friends are going to tempt you and are doing stuff that you know is wrong, that goes against Jesus, stay away from them. If going out to a pub is going to lead you to get smashed, don't go there. If you find that there are people or places that are tempt you back into your addictions, then run from them. If social media is bad for you, it's making you jealous and envious, it's encouraging gossip, delete it. Don't be complacent. 
Yes, we've got to be out engaging with people like we saw last week, giving up our rights for them, but never at the cost of disobeying Jesus. Holiness is more important than conformity. And it's hard because the reality is temptation is everywhere. There's always these things trying to seek to to get you off the race, to distract you. But look at what Paul says in verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But if you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so you could endure it. See, if you want to memorize a verse from today, that's the verse, right? Next time you're feeling tempted, it's hard, it's brutal. Just open your Bible up to 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. Nobody's too far gone. If you muck up, just remember, temptation is not a dead end. There is a way out of it. Everyone will be tempted, but there's always a way out. And I think one of those ways is to avoid being in the situations in the first place. Like if I know I'm going to be in a situation where I'm going to be tempted, don't go into the situation. Don't stick your your foot over the edge of the cliff to see how far you can get away with it. Stay away. Next time you feel that pressure. Here's, here's, I think, one practical thing that we can do when we're tempted. One way that shows a kind of discipline of wanting to live for Jesus. Pray. When temptation comes, pray. Ask for God to help you see the way out. Ask him to give you the strength to walk the way out and then do it. Running this race requires discipline. And so Paul says, look at the past warnings. They didn't make it serious stuff all of that with Israel all of that happened to benefit and teach the church of Jesus now don't make the same mistakes they did that's the first thing we do we learn from the warnings of the past secondly flee from the idols of the present right so picture a runner running a race and then there's all these things at the side of the race trying to distract him (laughs) trying to lure him off track Paul calls them idols. And he says, verse 14, Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. Now, idolatry means worshipping a false god. That's what that word means, okay? So, Paul says to the Corinthians, look, don't be relaxed. Don't go, hey, I'm just going to the temple just to have a wee meal with my friends. And, you know, they're bowing down to idols, but it's okay. I'm just kind of sitting there. He says, no, we will get out, bolt, get away from that place. Why? I mean, it's not real. He's just, he says that like in verse 18. He says it's not real. The food sacrificed to the idols is not real. Why should they get away? Well, says Paul, they might not be real gods, but behind every idol, there is a dark force at work. There are demons. And the devil and his demons are active. The Bible's clear on that. So we believe in God, we believe in Jesus, but there's also a dark spiritual reality out there behind every... Uh, and the devil's demons are active they're behind everything and their aim is to try and lure people away from Jesus they're behind all these idols right so their aim is not like in the films where these evil spirits make your bed levitate and rotate your head 360 degrees no what they want to do the chief aim of demons and of the devil is to stop you looking to Christ trusting in him and finding real forgiveness in him They want you to worship something man-made rather than come to the truth. And so if you're saying you're a Christian and yet you're going to a pagan temple to get something to eat, Paul says you are joining in a demonic activity. Can't do that. See, at church, um, we also do something that involves eating and drinking. We're going to do it in a few weeks' time. It's called communion. We drink wine. And we eat the bread to remember the sacrifice of Jesus for us. But it's more than just a remembrance. When we do that together, it's like Jesus participates in it with us. Like there's this presence of Christ. He is with us. I think that's what Paul's saying in in verse 16. He uses that word participate a lot. Jesus is participating with us. And it's the sign of our oneness together with him. 
Paul says, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. We are together with Christ. And if the Corinthians do that in church, and then after the service, head to the pagan temple to get a burger, then they are participating with something demonic when they're there. And he says, you can't do both. You can't, you can't participate with Christ and then go and participate with a demon. It's like, um, it's like if you're married, right? And you say to your husband or your wife, <clears throat> I love you. I want to be with you for the rest of my life. And then you go away and sleep with someone else. That's how the Corinthians are treating Jesus. And look, if your husband or wife is cheating on you, what are you going to feel? Anger. Resentment. resentment. I think one of the things you'll really feel as well is jealousy. And not all jealousy is bad. You're jealous because you love them and they made a promise to you. It's the same with God. He loves his people and he, he hates when they do the dirty on him. Verse 22, are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? You cannot indulge sinful idolatry and say you want to follow Jesus. The Corinthians are flirting with demons and it's time for them to pull back. If they don't, they're not going to make it. You can't persistently make Jesus jealous, thinking you're stronger than him, thinking everything will be fine. Paul says, flee from idolatry. Now, as I said, for us today, we're probably not tempted to go to any temples and worship statues. Though, actually, you know, for a lot of Christians across the world, that is the big temptation. Right, if you come out of a Hindu background or a Buddhist background or even, you know, in many cultures, like in Chinese culture, the worship of ancestors, all that's there. And if you come out of that and your family's still doing that, when you go and visit them and they say, hey, come along to the temple with us, what are you going to do? Paul says you say no, because what that, what's behind that is demonic. Anything that turns people away from true salvation in Jesus is demonic. That's why one of the worst things that we can see today seems like something very nice, but it's awful. One of the worst things we'll see in our culture today is when people have multi-faith services, in which they worship loads of different gods and everyone celebrates it and they applaud themselves thinking they're great. But all the while they are arousing the Lord's jealousy publicly abusing him and doing it all in the name of the false god of tolerance the way you love people from a different religion is not to pretend that they're the same as you or to force them into your mold you love them by being there for them caring for them despite the differences giving up what you can sharing the gospel with them true love doesn't affirm everything someone believes it's loving them despite what they believe because here's the truth there is demonic forces behind these other religions but look it's not just other religions right so, so do you believe that these demonic forces <coughs> behind the so i think that's what paul's saying here i think that seems to be what he's saying so that, any god that checks you this god you should know it. so anything but not just that not just religions anything that seeks to stop people finding forgiveness and hope in jesus because he is the only way to be saved and so an idol is anything that we put in place of God, not just another religion. So everyone here, right, in Charleston and in Scotland worships idols. Or they, everyone here worships something, right? It might be an idol, it might not be. And so how, wh what do I mean by that? How, what's an idol? Well, ask yourself, what is it that you are living for? What do you think about at night when your mind is left to wander? Where does your mind go? Where do you look for reassurance when you are struggling? What is your life built upon? Whatever that is, it is your God. And if it's not Jesus, it's not the real God. People build their lives on their job, could be the reputation, could be the idea of being successful, could be money, could be the drink or the drugs, could be family and friends even, good things. Whatever it is, if it's what you live for, it's your God. And so we want to avoid making things idols in our life. And we want to avoid participating in idol worship. For example, if I'm saying I'm a Christian and I'm hanging out with people who, who drink loads, 
used that example a few times because they love it. That's great because I want to hang out with them so I can get an opportunity just to live for Jesus, speak for Jesus with them. But what's not great, if I start to participate in that and get drunk myself, stay away. If I'm going on a night out, that can be good because I'm with people who don't know Jesus. But if they're all going out to sleep with someone because sex is a big idol in our culture. Yeah, not before marriage, you know. Yeah, right, yeah. yeah, before marriage, like just sleeping around. It's a big idol in our culture. And if I go out with people who are going out to do that and I get tempted to participate in it, then I should leave. I'll hang out with them some other way. If I find that money spending is a big idol that tempts me, big idol I think for many people, don't go to the bookies or the bingo, right? Don't participate in the idol of greed. You can come to bingo here at seniors lunch because you only win chocolates, not money. But the rest of it, you know, I don't want to get more excited about a paycheck than my relationship with Jesus. If my idol is my obsession with what people think about me or how I appear, I might want to avoid participating in worshipping that idol by making sure I don't flirt mindlessly or read certain magazines that make me think about my self-image or look at certain websites. Paul is not saying stay away from people who worship idols. Last week he said you've got to be with them. But he is warning on participating in idol worship. Our hearts are always sinful and there will always be something that we will be tempted to put in place of Jesus. So let's avoid places where we will make that sin come true. So just practically, just got to ask ourselves, what is the idol that I might be tempted to put in place of Jesus? And how can I make sure I flee from it? I don't want to have communion in church here and then go out and cheat on Jesus. So we've got to keep that focus. It's discipline. This is why I think, so this wee diagram from Vaughn that I printed off from Vaughn Roberts' book kind of sums up 1 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10. And I think it's really helpful. So in thinking about any decisions we make, does the Bible allow it? No, don't do it. If it does, yes, ask yourself, does my conscience allow it? If your conscience says no, don't do it. If your conscience says yes, here's the three questions on 8, 9, and 10. What effect will this have on other Christians? You saw that in chapter 8. Ask yourself that. Ask yourself, what will effect will it have on non-Christians? So that in chapter 9. And then today's passage, what effect will it have on my spiritual health? If I do this, if I go here, what's going to be the effect on me? Will I be led potentially into something that could be dangerous for my spiritual well-being? Keep going. Finally, much briefer, just to sum up the point. We're coming back to what he says at the start. If we're to keep going, we learn from the lessons of the past, we flee from the idols of the present, and finally we keep our eyes on the prize. Chapter 9, verse 24, run in such a way to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. In every decision we make, we want to honour and glorify God. We want to love others in the church. We want to reach those outside the church because we know the end goal. We know where we're going. And no matter what has happened in your life, what you have done or where you come from, if you come to Jesus, you are completely forgiven of all sin and you are going to be with him in eternity. You don't need to sort yourself out. Jesus does it all by his grace. You're going to be with him free from all sin and suffering and death. That is the crown that awaits us. And that is going to happen. And that's why if we are to keep going, we need to have one eye on that finish line. We are not here for us now. We are here for Jesus' church in eternity. That's the goal. That's what life is about. We don't run aimlessly. Let me pray, take some questions. Father, I pray that you would help us to flee from idolatry. Help us to learn from the example of Israel, not to be like them, but help us to be like Paul, disciplined, focused, with that eye on the future glory of being with Christ. Help us not live and make all our decisions on what benefits us now, but help us look out and love others, care for those in the church, to make decisions that will not lead them into sin. Help us go out to people who are not in the church to give up our freedom so that we can reach them with the gospel. 
Help us to glorify you in all decisions, not compromising on any area of holiness, but seeking to live wholeheartedly for you, being in the world, but not of the world. Father, it's such a hard balance. Sin and temptation are everywhere. And yet we praise you that when you hold us, you keep us, you carry us. And when temptation comes, there is always a way out. And we ask Almighty God for the strength to walk that way and therefore to trust and obey because we know there's no other way to be happy in Jesus unless we trust and obey. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Folks, any questions about that before we sing? Any questions or clarifications on anything? Yeah. Yeah, in, in, in eternity, do you mean? Yeah, or in, in eternity. Yeah. Be yeah, yeah, um, the, that's why it's like a race. Exactly, but it's not the eye on the prize type thing. But yeah. It's the eye that you have in it, so it's not. But coming to Christ now is, in some ways, really simple. You just come and you ask for forgiveness and you've got Jesus. And, and in some ways, it's the most simple thing. It's not like in other religions where you have to do lots of stuff for God to like you. That's not Christianity. You just come and give your sin. Well, yeah, you come and give your sin. Jesus forgives it all. But I think when you get that, you want to honor him and live for him and not do what the Corinthians are doing, which is thinking, oh, Jesus will just, doesn't matter. I'll just do what I want. And, and they think they're being very mature. And Paul's saying, well, actually, no, you guys are not, you're, you're being really immature and you're, You've been quite like Israel um, in the past, and that's not a good thing. Yeah, yeah, but he's he still he loves them. Yeah. He calls them. I think he says in verse um, fourteen, he says, um, "Therefore, my dear friends," which I think is interesting. Like he really cares about them, so he's not having a go saying you guys are a bunch of idiots. He's saying I'm really, really concerned about you. I'm really concerned that you think you're doing great. In actual fact, you think you're going forward, but I think you're maybe going backwards. And, and that's that, and he, he cares about them and where they're at. And he ma- wants to make sure that they, they do cross that finish line. Um, yeah. Takes a disagreement with strong, does it? You know, yeah. Really strong and well, he would say it's good to be weak. So he says earlier in the letter, because weakness means you don't depend on yourself. When you're weak, you trust in God. So just bring it all to God. Trust him. Don't keep looking to yourself because you can't do it. You need Christ. Um, Yeah. Any other questions? It's good. Good. Okay. If you can. Yeah. Um, Let's sing. Let's sing uh, a song just to encourage us to keep going. The song's called Flee From Sin, Run To Jesus. It was written by our friends at Twitch Schemes. Um, and it's all about just fighting that battle of temptation and keeping running that race, keeping focused on Jesus, fighting knowing that you are going to win and that victory has been assured for you because Christ has taken our sin.
pray just as we remain standing. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy to the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.